Leaf springs sagging over time. That's can o worms, isn't it? And what the hell can you do about it if your car catches that? I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. <laughs> I do it just sitting down here, chilling in the fat cave. Go figure. Australia only though. And if you're interested, website. Card. Maybe. Now, Gavin Fisher. Fisho. He's got a question about these saggy springs. What's going on there? Fisho says. I have an engineering question regarding resetting ute rear leaf packs. Some say they can be reset and reset to original height after they have sagged a bit. I'm questioning this, if it is possible after leaf springs become worn or settled in. Is it possible that the leaves can be heated, thus resetting the height, or is this Facebook mechanics just talking nonsense? Like, that'd be the first time ever for that, Fisher. There's quite a lot of material science engineering tomfoolery to unpack inside all of this issue, so let us bust a myth up front, which is steel springs sagging. That is such a non-thing. Steel structures do not function this way. So let's recap. Here's a leaf spring that coincidentally is also a steel rule. All right, now you can put a load on it and it deflects, obviously, and it wants to push back and go flat. And the reason it goes flat every time, it doesn't stay bent when you let go, is that the steel is operating under what's called its elastic limit. And that would also be known as the yield point where you draw a stress strain curve and there's a bit of a blip, right? And what that does is it defines the boundary between this kind of elastic deformation here and permanent or plastic deformation if you get into it too severely. So although it may appear to you that your leaf springs have sagged, quote unquote, over time, what's really happening here is you've bent them by making them endure loads that they were not ever designed to experience. So the easiest way to do that, obviously, is to load a vehicle up heavily and then drive excessively fast over something like a spoon drain or a wash away or a speed hump or some isolated geometric deficiency in the surface, okay? And that just basically imposes these huge dynamic loads and if the design of the spring is a bit dodgy and the bump stops don't adequately protect it some of the deformation once you go beyond that elastic limit is just going to be permanent right and there's not much you can do about that now let's say you own a vehicle for i don't know five years or something and once every three months you just hit something a little bit too hard, like I just described. And let's say there's two millimeters of permanent deformation in the springs from doing that. Okay, that's eight millimeters a year over five years. That'd be 40 millimeters of additional sag, if you like. Now, this is not a time domain thing. This is not springs sagging over time, right? This is them sagging as a result of four times a year times five years, so 20 events where you overloaded them dynamically and they bent as a result. See, we could put this rule up on a couple of one, two, three blocks and stick something heavy in the center of it and then get in Jules Friggin Verne's time machine and go forward in time a thousand years and take the load off and the rule would just spring back and be straight afterwards. It's not a time thing, okay? The time thing, sagging over time, affects things that are made out of timber, like fences. You know how fences get a bit, you know, saggy over time because they get rained on and they dry out and they're carrying their own weight in between the posts, right? Well, natural fibres are a bit like that. Steel, not so much. So, this whole business about resetting springs, okay, yes, it is absolutely possible. I think the ghetto reset where you don't heat them up, that is fraught with risk because if you've got permanent deformation in a steel thing and you bend it back, then 
you really are opening the door to a fatigue type failure, particularly with hard materials like hardened and tempered leaf springs. And we'll get into that in a minute because if you want to reset a spring pack, what you really have to do is remove it from the vehicle and get it in an oven and get it up to that sort of red, orange temperature, the blacksmithy kind of temperature. And then you've got to, in a controlled way, bend it back to its original shape. Now, once you've done that, I guess an alternative is you could normalize the whole spring pack, which is you heat it up to that red color and then you just turn the oven off and let it cool down really, really slowly. And then that'll remove the hardening and the tempering. All of the heat treatment will go and then you'll be able to reform the steel cold manually, you put it in a press or something and just get it back to the shape. That's fine also, but an easier, more expeditious way of doing it is just to blacksmith the shit out of it and bend it back while it's hot, okay? And you need to do the whole pack together because each leaf has to conform closely to the leaf above and below it. Otherwise, the pack's not going to work really well. So there's that. So you've got to do the blacksmithy thing and then you'll have to reinstate the heat treatment of that steel. And the heat treatment is in, you count them, two parts, dude. There's hardening and then there's tempering. So hardening is like if you're making a knife at home or something like that, it has to be out of a kind of steel that is amenable to being hardened, which, for example, the big steel beams above me, the low carbon steel they use for that's a really good material for some things, but it's not amenable to being hardened. So spring steel is, and there'd be a particular hardening formula, but generally the recipe goes like this. You heat it up to a temperature like between 800 and 1,000, maybe 1,100 degrees C. It depends on the actual steel. And if you're doing it in the ghetto, one test for this is you can put a magnet on it as it heats up. And when it gets to a particular point, usually about 770 degrees C, steel loses its ferromagnetic properties okay so that's how you know you're in the zone put it in for a little bit longer it'll be in that 800 900 range and then you let it soak for a while at that temperature if you can and then you quench it in something now the quench will be defined by the actual recipe of the steel as well it could be into cold water it could be into some sort of salt it could be into oil that is preheated to some temperature like I don't know 50 or 60 degrees C is kind of common and the reason for doing it all this different way all these different ways sorry is you just have to control the temperature change because that otherwise opens the door to cracks okay so anyway you quench it like that and then you end up with a really really hard spring pack that is sort of permanently the shape you want but it's too hard to use and that's why you have to temper it. Now, tempering, which is something that's done all over the shop, like twist drills and knives and all sorts of cutters made of steel, anything made of tool steel or high-speed steel, the jaws of, you know, you know, pipe wrenches and things of this nature, they're all formed up first and then they're hardened and tempered. And the tempering, right, what that does is it makes them tougher, it makes them less brittle, less likely to just crack as a result of being used, okay? And tempering for something like a knife is going to be a bit more mundane than for a spring because you need springs to be tougher because they get bent so much and they're meant to be able to endure millions of cycles, right? So when you temper something like a knife, you could do it in a sandwich toaster, like a sandwich oven, a, one of those bench top boxes that gets up to about 200 degrees C. You just set it on maximum, you put your knife blank in there after you've forged it up and ground it to shape and hardened it. You put it in there, it's nice and polished because you've given it a rub after hardening, and then you leave it there for a couple of hours and you look at it and it goes that sort of burnt straw color, that kind of dirty yellow. When it gets there, your knife is good to go. You could even do two cycles of that if you wanted. So basically, when you get it up to the 200 and you give it a couple of hours of soak, you just flick the oven off, go home for the night, come back, do it all again tomorrow, and then your knife is going to be pretty tough. All right, With a spring, instead of doing it at 
200 degrees C, you're probably more like 275 or even 300 degrees. And you probably have to give it a couple of cycles to temper it up and then they can hand you back your reset spring and you are good to go, dude. And I'd suggest there's a couple of problems with that, right? Number one is if the, if the spring's bent the first time and you just reset them and you use them the same way again, What's going to happen in just a few months? You're going to hit those bumps, bend them back, dogs and cats living together, why bother? The other thing is, look at all of these energy-intensive and skill-intensive processes that have to do with reforming leaf springs. You need all of that temperature-controlled whatever. You need the blacksmithy skills to bend it all back to the right shape. You need to take actual measurements off the vehicle if you don't have the factory specs and determine how much manipulation is required to give you the ride height that you want to restore. That all requires skill and equipment. Then you've got the tempering process, which is going to add like a couple of days, right? Why bother? Why not just get yourself a decent set of aftermarket springs that are maybe a little bit on the heavy duty side and therefore the door is not going to be open to the extensively reformed standard spring pack just getting itself bent progressively over the next several months. I think as a practical matter, the only, the only time to consider resetting a leaf spring is if it's off something really exotic that you can't match. Like if you're restoring some, I don't know, Leyland P76, I don't even know if they had rear leaf springs. But if it's something that you can't get a spring for, that's going to be kind of a big deal, there's nothing you can buy off the rack, then yeah, okay, maybe it's worth going to that time and trouble. But I'd suggest that for everyone else who's just got their ute or their old patrol or something and the springs have given up the ghost because of years of misuse or maybe they were materially defective to start with, the best option is just go to the aftermarket industry, say, mate, I want to set a heavy duty standard height or lifted whatever rear springs for my, my Hilux and then just drop it in one day and you'll be picking it up at lunchtime, good to go for less money and a lot less time and stress.